K-N-O-X. And my next guest is no stranger to the show. Jeff Fortenberry represents Nebraska's first congressional district in the House of Representatives. He's on the House Appropriations Committee, the House Agricultural Rural Development, Food and Drug Administration, and Related Agencies Subcommittee, and State Foreign Operations and Related Programs Subcommittee. Congressman, welcome back. A pleasure to talk to you, Olivier. Thanks for having me on. So, um, just from a from a constitutional perspective, I'm supposed to be holding you to account, but I want to flip the script for a second, and I want to ask you. Um, so, because I've covered foreign policy and politics for for more than two decades, I tend to develop these little obsessions. I tend to develop these little interests, and I tend to track stories that others might not track. And I want to ask you whether you think, on balance. Um, those of us in the news media are too concerned with coronavirus, not concerned enough. What's your perspective? The, the media lurches day by day from issue to issue, creating urgency and fire alarms, and it's exhausting people um, in America and worldwide. It's part of the reason that people's um, sense of well-being is, um, I guess, stressed, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, it, and now the coronavirus is an important issue. Don't don't let me minimize that. And actually, there's a very important connection in Nebraska. We're getting ready to to receive. Oh, it's approximately a, it might even be over a hundred people, Americans, who have been evacuated from China because we have a specialized system at the University of Nebraska's Med Center to take care of people affected with infectious disease. That's likely to grow in the future as we look at. Um, I would say a more holistic approach to national security, particularly around health. So this is a project of the potentially our Defense Department as well as our Health and Human Services, and at the university there we have an important component of it. So there need, I guess, to the, your deeper question. Um, uh, look, we can't be alarmist for your profit making. This is the problem. You have a responsibility to be um, to present present uh, present news uh, objectively, facts objectively as best you can. Bias comes in when you prioritize certain things and not other things, right. or you're editorializing in the name of presenting facts. So I just think the media, media needs to do its own sort of reflection, self-reflection, and see if we can't get back to first principles. I didn't realize there was that connection to, uh, to Nebraska. Is that, a, is that a, one of the CDC-connected programs? What's the nature of the, the University of Nebraska? Uh, there, there is an alliance with um, with Atlanta as well as a hospital system in New York, as I recall. But it was an, an initiative under the Health and Human Services Department earlier when the Ebola epidemic broke out. Uh, right. so they took some Ebola cases to Nebraska and it developed a highly specialized infectious disease unit that is going to receive America. Now, they're not infected, but it is a precautionary measure, and actually they're staying at a National Guard camp. Right, right. This is the the fourteen day quarantine where they're checking people's temperatures, their vitals every day. Right. Correct. And they've already been checked, and they don't have indication of the disease of the virus, I should say. Uh, but it is a precautionary measure. So, do you find yourself in the position of having to explain to your constituents what's going on there, how seriously to take it, whether or not? To, I mean, obviously, the the balance that every person in a position of authority has to strike is take it seriously, but don't panic, you know, wash your hands, but don't bunker up in your house. So do you find yourself talk, communicating with constituents about this? Well, I, I, let, let me give you in the media actually a little plug. Uh, I think the media has done a pretty good job of covering this. Uh, we have to have a certain level of concern without being alarmed uh, on this particular one. But so uh, in this regard, I don't find myself in the driver's seat, particularly because I have the University of Nebraska who is handling all communications in this regard and are doing a really good job. Oh, okay. So they're taking point on explaining to, 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 to the people of Nebraska exactly what is and is not happening. Uh, they are point on this in the media um, in general, yeah. Well, that's good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I, I actually have... Um, you know, coronavirus actually is a family of viruses, and the common cold being one, and I appear to have it. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about... about I'm glad you uh, qualified your answer a little bit there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, so uh, I'm, uh, I'm not a virologist, but my wife's a molecular virologist, so I get a lot, really? of, I get a lot of this stuff at home. Well, no wonder you answered the, or asked me that question from the start. <laughs> uh, okay. There's a, I understand context. <laughs> my, uh, my, uh, my, my people have a phrase called « déformation professionnelle », which means the tendency of people to see the world through the lens of their work. Um, so, you know, as a, as, a, as a journalist, as a reporter, I see things a certain way. And, yeah. and my wife, as a, as a virologist, also see, sees things a certain way. And when it, when it actually touches on viruses, she's definitely got some opinions. 
Well, what made you think I couldn't translate the French that you just uttered? Oh, I didn't. I wasn't sure that my listeners would be able to translate oh, okay. the French that I just uttered. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you never want to. You never want to. You know, that, that's another balancing act that we do in the media. You know, do, when do you assume? Um, when I when I worked for AFP, actually, I was uh, initially not allowed to say uh, in my lead in the first paragraph of my story House Speaker Newt Gingrich. I had to say U.S. President Bill Clinton's top opponent in the U.S. Congress. What? Yeah, we, we had to qualify U.S. President Bill Clinton as though there was another Bill Clinton running around out there. And is, do you think that's a form of overt bias? No, what that was was if I'm writing for uh, the Aussies and the Thai and the Japanese oh, and and the Indonesians um, and and the, because that's, AFP has a huge um, huge readership in Asia, um, writing for an international audience. The the and and that changed that changed over time. But writing for an international audience when I started out uh, started out in '96, the um, the style guide sort of the, what we were required to write was. U.S. President Bill Clinton's top opponent in the Congress, top Republican opponent in Congress, and we had to refer to the to the Republicans as uh, the the opposition party um, versus the president's party for the Democrats. It was it was all a question about what do you assume your readers know and where, and that's changed a lot in part because of the internet. Yeah, that's that's interesting. A lot of other countries have parliamentary systems where that kind of language makes more sense, but it, it for us it appears it's bias. Right, that's right. It, it it certainly can. I mean, we all the other problem we had was the word table. Because in some countries that means propose, and in others country, in other countries, including the U.S., it means essentially to kill. Right. That means for us, that's a procedural move to stop something of substance. <laughs> so, so these are all challenges that you have when you're writing for an international audience. You know, what that, what do they know? What do they not know? Um, how do you not insult them? Is another one. Hmm. Well, that helps me get to know you better. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Thank you. <laughs> you're very welcome. <laughs> um, I want to get your perspective on on State of the Union. Um, I was I was what. What did you take away about what the president would do in a second term if he's given one by the American voters? Well, when I walked off the floor and did four television interviews afterward, the first thing I said, it was an all-American speech, mashed potatoes and gravy uh, about national security, keeping us safe, elevating the problem of health care's escalating costs and, and some of the ideas of what we can do about it. Obviously, there was a list of things, of policy things, uh, many of which are very, very important. And then a, a number of beautiful human moments, especially when he uh, gave the commendation to the uh, Tuskegee Airmen and recognition and, and promotion. Um, but I, I, I tell you, when, and I've been a, through a number of state of the unions, but the, the moment when that military family was reunited, I had to grab my handkerchief. I thought that was a beautiful, poignant moment. So um, this is a great thing about America. Uh, the State of the Union is our grand political theater. Um, uh, the President of the United States comes before the Congress, the People's House, the United States Senate, the Judiciary, all, almost all of the cabinet. The entire government is nearly there and makes his case. And we applaud, and we critique, and people react afterward. But it, it really is a clear moment of this own, uh, most American thing that captures worldwide attention. It, str it speaks to our strength in spite of this divisive moment. I was, I, so you're right about the human moments, although I will say that the human moment that got me the most was entirely unscripted, and it was when 13-year-old uh, um, Gage Hake comforted his mom as she was on the verge of tears when the president was paying tribute to, uh, to her slain uh, uh, soldier husband. That was, yeah. the one, that was the one that gutted me. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, that kid trying to discreetly comfort his mom. Um, yeah. I was just on, on the policy, though, I was struck by a couple things. The president has in the past teased out the possibility of trying to work out a, a fresh middle class tax cut, and that wasn't in there, and North Korea wasn't in there, but Iran was. I, was, I mean, I, I don't want to overread into this stuff, but I, was, I, was a, I thought that was a little curious. Well, um, he did begin the speech with a, a long list of economic accomplishments. And frankly, I think it was important to point that out because we take these things for granted unless they're stated to us. Lowest unemployment rate in 50 years, uh, upward pressure on jobs or upward pressure on wages and jobs. And that's, that's a very important point because um, – of a number of factors, including our manufacturing leaving and bad trade deals and um, downward, uh, and frankly, illegal immigration. There's been downward pressure on wages, and that's fr frankly not fair. So we're seeing a time in which they're rising. So I thought it was important, uh, obviously beneficial to him, that he point out the, the good economic 
news there. Um, right, there was no mention of North Korea. The, 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 the speech was a little smaller on international affairs, but we are in an election year, and people want to focus on what's near and dear to them at home. It's just human reality. Fair enough. I was just I was just curious because I thought I thought you know if he's going to mention Iran where things are still very much a work in progress, why not also mention North Korea where things are very much a work in progress? And it just seemed curious. Yeah, that, that's a that could be a fair critique. But again, I think there was a very heavy emphasis on domestic policy as well as national security. But the, given the, the freshness of the event uh, in Iraq with the killing of the Iranian uh, Soleimani, right? I, I think that's why that was highlighted. That makes sense. That makes sense to me as well. Um, uh, I'm generally not super inclined to talk about things like empty calories, like the the speaker tearing up the speech. But if you have any thoughts, feel free to share them. Well, um, I'll, I'll comment on that. But can I add one more thing? Of course. I do that. Of there course. was a line in the president's speech called the Trillion Tree Initiative. It, it kind of went by fast, but this is an important line because it is. Um, frankly, an attempt, I think, by Republicans to reclaim our heritage and in terms of environmental security and protecting our world. And while we have major debates about what environmental policy ought to be, we have environmental policy. We have strong environmental policy in this country, and we need to be creative about it, how we move forward. So this is a 21st century architecture as to how we attack the problem of pollution and externality costs that aren't embedded in production costs or in certain manufacturing, particularly those in China and India and other, other places. And so by talking to the issue of a tree and how we as communities can come together to plant trees, it is one of the most effective ways to sequester carbon, create national, uh, natural beauty, uh, enhance biodiversity, and maybe sensitize us to the reality of stopping deforestation, which is, again, one of the best ways in which we can both conserve, which is a deep value of stewardship, but also sequester carbon. Uh, it's a preventative mechanism. So it was a quick line. It went by fast. But I think you're going to see more and more initiative, uh, certainly on my part, and we're looking at an international component of this because I had the International Conservation Caucus, one of the most vibrant, active caucuses in the entire con Congress. These are smart ideas. They appeal to a, a broad section of people who are very interested in this idea of this deep value of stewardship around natural beauty, reclaiming biodiversity, moving from an economic model whereby we take, we make, and we waste to one in which we regenerate. That's a virtuous economic cycle, and we've got to get there in the 21st century. So the TREE initiative is a – it's not the fullness of an answer, but it is a clear, tangible policy initiative that could change the nature of our foreign aid programs, but also recreate some things internally, domestically in our, in our country that will be very beneficial to urban forestation as well as forest management – and reclaiming decimated land through new habitat and biodiversity. That's exciting stuff. And I, I'm sorry to go on so long. No, I actually, I'd much rather talk about that than about the theatrics. So let's stay well, on, let's stay on me that. Me too. Look, I think let's, we really need to get beyond uh, the theatrics. When the President of the United States walks into uh, the House of Representatives for the State of the Union, uh, I think it's important, it's a matter of decorum, that people stand. They don't have to clap or applause, but I think some respect there. Um, uh, Nancy Pelosi has always been very gracious to me, uh, very kind to my family. I just don't like this whole atmosphere in which we're living in, in which we are sort of politicizing grievance, weaponizing grievance for political points. It's exhausting. We need to get beyond all of this. Look, when President Obama was in office, I, I, I clapped for him. Uh, I shook his hand on the aisle. Um, that was caught on television, got a lot of political blow blowback where I live, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> It's about the, protecting the value of the institution. Yeah, and the and respect for the office, whatever you think of the man or his right. policies. So let's let's stick with the let's stick with the trees then, because I'm actually this is something that I'm not fluent in, and I'm actually really interested. That that would suggest some level of federal, state, and local partnership. So what's the what's the status on, uh, of that? Well, it's it's interesting you should say that um, right there in the Great Plains where I live, the beginning of the Great Plains, um, where the Missouri River woodland bottom stops, the Great Plains starts, and that's that's my home. It's the home of Arbor Day, and so we don't have a lot of trees in Nebraska, so interestingly, we have, but we founded Arbor Day, the tree planting community organization uh, in which multiple communities across our nation actually become a tree city, and they plant. Uh, Arbor Day gives trees to individuals to plant. Uh, this is their sole mission. They do a beautiful job. I'm very proud of what they do. Even in my hometown of Lincoln, their foundation has about 100 employees. So... There, we've got a built-in platform there 
for any corporate entity or other international entity that wants to join in and, and promote tree planting. Uh, they actually work intimately with the Forest Service as well. Forest Services manages a, a lot of forests throughout the nation. Better mm-hmm. forest management can actually increase biodiversity and habitat and create new economic options for the use of wood, particularly in building products, and that'll be a part of a bill that's going to be presented shortly to give incentives for the use of, again, sustainable wood products in building. The, the other component of which that I'm, I'm going to take a, a very deep interest in and hopefully a leadership role is some reforms in our foreign aid package that really make conservation a robust key to help uh, areas that have had land decimation or deforestation or have been exploited by extractive resource uh, exploitation or, or extraction uh, the Chinese do that, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, I think maybe on your last show I, I mentioned that Secretary Pompeo was before my committee one day, and, he, I, and I asked him how much the, the Chinese give away in humanitarian aid, and the question stumped him. I wasn't intending to stump him, but it, it just was to make the point that, as he said, I think it's about zero. When an economy that big is about extractive resource taking throughout the world, they need to move quickly, If again, assuming a responsibility among the community of nations, for also protecting precious habitat and biodiversity and creating a virtuous economic cycle whereby communities benefit from healthy harvesting and regeneration of forest as well as land. And there's all kinds of new models of sustainability out there, precision agriculture, micro-agriculture. They're going to be an important part of this. And those are some of the spaces I lead in in Congress. Talking to Republican Congressman Jeff Fortenberry of Nebraska's 1st Congressional District. So let me ask you, what what uh, what foreign countries or territories are the are sort of the optimal targets of this program overseas? Kenya. Kenya, is, the, is that the main one? Well, that's my idea. In fact, I just had the ambassador in here, and we were speaking about it. Kenya receives a very great, a, high, a, a large amount of foreign aid from us, a very important country, uh, strategic, economically. There's going to be some movement forward toward a more specialized trade uh, agreement, perhaps sometime soon. Um, we lost three troops, three soldiers there recently, uh, because there's a lot of terrorist activity to the north. Uh, Kenyans do a lot of fighting on behalf of cre- creating uh, stability in that region. It's a very important country, and as, as they lead, so much of Africa could potentially lead. Uh, we worked in the southern part of Africa as well on a tri-national conservation area. Uh, Africa's critical. I, I, Africa's at a crossroads. They, they, their hearts, in a certain sense, are with America, but the Chinese are everywhere extracting resources, paying off strong men, and uh, building stuff, stuff that really doesn't last, but not really creating what I, what I keep calling that virtuous economic cycle. Uh, they're waiting for America, and it's creating a conservation platform, which again, protects forests, manages land, and creates new community opportunities for community economic well-being, is the conservation foreign aid model of the future, because everybody wins. So I, I'm looking at Kenya as potentially a model state. We've got huge, big opportunities, though, in Central and South America. Colombia is leading in this regard. I uh, just had some nice dialogue with the Brazilians as well about some of these topics. So we're on the front end of something important. The Brazilians would seem to be an interesting conversation, given what's going on in the Amazon. Absolutely. Uh, huge, huge resources, very large population, a country that is going to emerge as one of a, a very strong country in the, in the world's future in the coming decades. Uh, they're going through some political reforms and swinging back and forth, if you will, between ideologies. Uh, but, yeah, very important country in terms of uh, biodiversity, economic sustainability, as, as well as economic production for, the well, for their people's well-being. Well, our time has flown by, Congressman, so I, uh, I'm, I have to say thank you very much once again for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Well, this is kind of a fun interview because it's uh, a little more conversational, and we can just unpack a lot of topics. I really appreciate the platform. Uh, it's my pleasure, sir. Congressman Jeff Fortenberry, Republican representing Nebraska's 1st Congressional District in the House. Congressman, thanks very much for your time today. Thank you.